Thank you, everybody, for joining us here for All That Matters. I actually want to start by reminding everybody it's actually the 18th birthday for Branded. And uh, this event, you know, um, I remembered from the early days, it actually started as Music Matters, and now it's evolved and expanded into All That Matters. And I'm actually really proud to be on stage with Sung Moon, No Relation Cho, um, because in many ways, his company for Music Matters 23, hashtag Matters 23, he actually checks off maybe two to three boxes on this grid here. Obviously, music matters, but perhaps marketing matters and definitely digital matters. And um, as much as people... as well. And gaming. Oh, yes. And so one of the interesting things about um, Sung Moon and more importantly, Chartmetric, is as much as people talk about disruptive music tech companies from Asia that have gone global, um, you know, obviously we can talk about TikTok to Tencent Music, but one of the other companies that has quietly made waves and has been incredibly disruptive in the music industry is Chartmetric. Um, for those of you who don't know, but I think many of you do because you're here, uh, Chartmetric is definitely one of the smartest, arguably one of the sexiest data analytics companies out there. He's grinning because I told him over Soju and he didn't believe I'd say it. But nonetheless, um, it has become a very essential, very crucial tool for many of us in the music industry, whether you work as a label, a manager, promoter, producer, wherever, whenever, in real time, Chartmetric is currently not only pumping out the data, but providing analytics that allows us to make our work bigger, better, faster, and that could almost be a new uh, Daft Punk song. But I'll leave it at that. Um, as much as you know, today's uh, panel is about the present and more importantly the future, I think many of us, myself included, are actually quite curious about the founder story and how this all came together and how this all started. And so, um, Sung Moon, I wanted you to sort of share with us, you know, look, you were already a very successful executive at a local Korean gaming company. You moved on and became a very successful uh, executive at an international tech company. And yet, you decided to start over with a startup. What was the motivation or, or, or the mojo? Why? Wow, that's a deep question. Thank you for that. Uh, before I start, uh, I'm just curious, who in this room has heard about Chartmetric or using already? Thank you, thank you. That's amazing. Whoa, quite a few over there as well. Thank you, thank you. Wow, so inspiring. Past like eight years of journey, uh, nonstop working. Uh, now I, you know, like now we have this presence uh, here. Uh, so let us let me begin answering from that question. Uh, what made me to quit from this uh, like job at Oracle to start my own company when I already had one kid, two-year-old, and another kid who was just born, uh, two daughters. And I made that risky choice back then. Uh, the quick answer is I, I wanted to create my own story uh, with my life. Uh, many of us, you know, we first begin to work for someone else and then we associate ourselves with the company brand. You work for Google, you work for Facebook, and then that company uh, brand becomes you. But uh, it's so fragile, you know, the moment when, when, when you leave the company, that brand goes away. Like, you know, it still remains in your, on your resume. But uh, over time, it fades away. So I always wondered, how can I um, uh, create my own story so that it remains with me? And then like even you know, a, a story to tell to my kids. Now I have three. Someday, to my daughters, uh, this is what daddy did. This is what I did. And uh, as a result, there is this company that uh, has remained. So yeah, that was. Uh, one thing, and if I tell you just one more, when I go to parties or events like this, uh, when I was was working at Oracle, uh, I begin you know meeting some new people and begin to tell the story. Hey, you know I'm a product manager at Oracle, and it wasn't that topic wasn't that interesting to me, so probably not that yeah, funny to run to others. So. Crickets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, wanted to see, you know, like wanted to have that engaging and fun conversation with uh, people that I meet. I'm an, uh, an extrovert. I really enjoy meeting new people. So that, um, yeah, 
yeah, that was another yeah, uh, motivation. So for full disclosure, um, Sungmin and I, we've known each other since 2015. It's almost been about eight years. And early on, his startup was part of an incubator accelerator program called Spark Labs. And usually I'm asked to look at music tech companies and I probably reject 11 out of the 10 that I see. But yours was incredibly different and special. And what was really fascinating was um, originally you actually create a chart metric for the Korean music market and you were knocking on a lot of doors of a lot of big Korean music companies and it wasn't an easy sell. You know, obviously you've met all the bigger players, but I was wondering if you could talk about maybe one company that you knocked on the door and what that reaction was when you tried to pitch this idea of not just big data, but just data. What happened? Yeah. Um, I, I was living in the States um, after getting an MBA from UCLA and, and I was building my career and then that's when I started this company. But I moved, I went to Seoul to join this uh, accelerator program and that's where this idea came about after meeting with Bernie um, and I, I, I found this opportunity and I thought it was uh, you know, a good problem to solve. And then once I had that uh, prototype, I began to meet, you know, as a Korean, I thought maybe, you know, like Korean entertainment, it, the music industry is big, SM Entertainment, YG, JYP, now Hive. So I, uh, through networking, I managed to meet some of the executives in the marketing department. Uh, one of the company, uh, one marketing exe executive that I met, uh, I vividly remember, you know, I went into that meeting room, it was in this really fancy building, huge building in Gangnam district, of course, uh, that core part of Seoul. Don't dance, when... don't dance, <laughs> just keep going. And then uh, I walked into the room and I began to explain what we do. And uh, that person, uh, the director, uh, and then like two other people, junior people joined, and they looked at me like, um, we are already tracking the data, uh, like Facebook data, YouTube data, why do you do we need you uh, and like you're tracking like Twitter followers? Yeah, we know that already. And then I tr try to explain. Uh, once you have all this data in one place, maybe you can discover new artists or uh, your own artists when you manage. Uh, you can tell who is uh, gaining popularity, who is going more vital. Maybe those trends you can uh, detect better. And then that guy uh, was looking at me and said, you know what, uh, there is an easy way to see who's popular. Super easy. Just check out who is getting the biggest sponsorship for like TV commercials, who is getting paid more on TV commercials. That person is popular. BTS, for example, is, you know, can command no, this much don't, money. Don't say that yeah, much I'm in not, amount. I'm not saying it, but, uh, you know, that's, that's when I, I, I looked at him and he was like, hmm, uh, we don't really need a third-party data tool like this was the signal he was giving. Uh, I remember uh, how crestfallen I was. I almost thinking about, I thought about giving up. You know, the industry doesn't need me. The industry doesn't need another data analytics tool. Then why? What am I doing here? And that company uh, was SM Entertainment. <laughs> Uh, and now uh, it's a, a customer of ours. And uh, in, in terms of kind of a, a bizarre, happy ending, um, that particular company that gave him a hard time, uh, Sung Moon now is the newly elected board member of SM Entertainment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, thank you. I just joined about four months ago. Uh, I looked up that name and uh, he moved on to another company. Oh. I yeah. I figured. <laughs> <laughs> the doppelganger, that's always a problem. Um, but what was interesting was that when you started out basically thinking you were developing a local solution for a local market, when did you sort of have that flip the switch moment where, you know what, I could maybe take this global. And you know, as you started making that move to go global, who were some of your earliest champions and cheerleaders that really surprised you and stunned you? And then more importantly, when was that watershed moment when you realize, you know what, I don't have to wear my startup logo on my t-shirt anymore in public everywhere I go. Um, so in th those early days, uh, now, uh, in a nutshell, we are now tracking 9 million artists. Uh, we are updating 9 million artists profile 
and almost 70 million tracks, uh, unique ISRCs, uh, across 40 different, 30 to 40 different platforms, including Boomplay uh, from uh, Africa. Uh, of course, Melon, Line Music, all those local DSPs, not only Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube, and Amazon. Uh, we now have customers, all the big three labels, Universal Music Group, Sony, Warner, as well as Netflix, uh, Hypnosis uh, Songs Fund, Amazon Music, uh, Apple Music uh, as our customers. Um, but uh, going you know, f uh, all the way back, um, we, when we first built the, the service, the company, um, some artist managers, they were the first people who came to check on our services because big labels, they had those tools already in-house. Uh, and labels, somehow they had access to the data, but artist managers, yeah, they have access to the social media uh, data, but other than that, especially playlists, they also s really cared about how their artists are performing on different Spotify playlists, but it was so difficult for them to track and it was expensive and so manual. Uh, Bernie told me the story and how his company, uh, he had uh, this intern working for two hours every day just to check chart positions on iTunes across different companies. You had to actually go back and you know, change that country one by one to switch to different charts. So very manual task it was. Uh, so that was the first group yeah, of companies. That, that yeah, intern companies. quit on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, over time, uh, a little later, uh, I remember InGroove's music group, now, which now became part of Universal Music Group. They purchased the entire company. Uh, that was the the moment when they um, uh, like wired twenty four thousand dollars. That was a one year uh, subscription for their entire marketing team, like forty people. Uh, back then, we gave big discount, uh, and when when they joined, I and I that's when and they began to tell us how they are using chart metric in their uh, artist marketing. Um, so, uh, yeah, over time, we gained more customers. Now, one of the interesting things that you guys came out of the gates with is that, you know, when we talk about the hubs of music that's hip, that's hot, that's happening, it's usually generally assumed it's going to be somewhere in the UK, New York City, Los Angeles. But you guys discovered something completely different. And then more importantly, I just want to know who decided at the company to call it Trigger Cities. But you guys basically discovered that New York, LA, London, or were actually not the ground zeros for not just local, but international hits. Tell us about Trigger Cities, and I actually wanna know who on the staff came up with that term, but it's a great term, but Mike's yours. Uh, sure, uh, Chaz Jenkins, who is now a chief commercial officer, officer at Chartmetric, he came up with that and concept and began promoting, and he was speaking, whenever he goes to meetings, he began to, uh, talk about this topic and then people really uh you know like saw that and then they agreed uh what uh, what's what's happening in the music music industry i don't know if it's brand new with, with the streaming age or something but uh something really interesting was how these uh many uh southeast east asian cities including uh manila or uh you know, Jakarta, these are all mega cities, huge population in Latin America, Mexico City. These cities may uh, traditionally have not been generating much revenue for music labels, but in the streaming age, uh, we fi found out that those cities were playing huge roles. Manila City, for example, everyone knows like so, such a huge uh, population of YouTube listeners there, and they are also they also leave a lot in the, like comments in English. So in Philippines, when something you know when the artist goes viral in Philippines, it's uh, it becomes easier for them to uh, expand to the Western market. So that's one example. But what we found out was how these streaming platforms, since they have this uh, huge engine, computer engine, to discover new and upcoming and interesting music. When uh, the vi virality, virality happens in one, one of those cities with where uh, the city has big population or uh, so-called listeners, 
then the engine promotes that. Like there is a po positive uh, virality happening there. And over time, uh, the music breaks out of the country and then the artist breaks uh, uh, to other country. So back then, to in back, back uh, 2018, Love was that example. Uh, we when, uh, we analyzed quite, uh, in quite detail of how Love uh, was on some Brazili Brazilian Spotify playlist first and then Southeast Asian playlists and much later uh, made all made it all the way to the top uh, Spotify's uh, today's top is playlists uh, and so and so forth. So basically so, the next global or yeah. any global hit now has to emanate from Southeast Asia or Mexico City. That's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> um, the other question I wanted to ask is that, you know, obviously um, you're, you're partially inspired by documenting and tracking and monitoring sort of the rise of K-pop. But now at this particular conference, we're hearing about the um, emergence and expansion of other Asian music markets, other Asian music genres. And so, you know, if we have to say hit pause today for September in 2023, what are sort of the three big trends that you're seeing in the region when it comes to the export of certain Asian music genres? So I see, so K-pop, uh, I know about K-pop, uh, of course, quite a, quite a bit, but uh, I also see that Taiwanese, Taiwanese music or Vietnamese music, uh, all of these music, uh, they, they, they're uh, like our interesting artists coming out of those markets. Um, and uh, also many more experimentations of mer uh, uh, merging uh, those two different genres. So Western artists uh, popular in e Asia, of course, that happened all the time, but also Asian artists uh, gaining popularities in, in other markets as well. So one one recent example was the, just Japan and Korea working together, uh, this group called XG. So ABEX, a uh, big media group in Japan, they are currently working with YG, uh, and these are all Japanese members, 100% Japanese, but they were trained in Korea at YG headquarters with their trainers, uh, choreographies, and then they created this music video. Now they are huge in Southeast East Asia. They're big, pushing quite big. So uh, that experiment, uh, I don't know like whether that will be hugely successful or not, but so far, they're going quite well. So uh, oh. that's an interesting one. Well, the other um, thing that we're seeing is obviously everyone's talking about fandoms. It's the new F yeah. word. Fandistry, um, fanatics, and you know, um, fandoms. And obviously the people are talking about it on the business side. Mm -hmm. You've been monitoring the business side so that people can monetize the business side. Um, in terms of what Chartmetric has done in terms of really helping somebody whether it's a label or an artist or anyone in the industry to take a look at your data, what are sort of three things they can extract when it comes to studying the fan industry, the fandoms? Sure, uh, of course, where they are located and how engaged they are, they are, they are. And also another thing is how fans discover this artist in one platform and how that propagates to other platforms. So, for example, we have the, the audience data for TikTok, YouTube, uh, and Instagram. And uh, it's quite interesting to see how uh, the fans' locations or fans' demographic information uh, differs a little bit, platform by platform. And uh, the artists, uh, you know, like sometimes they gain those fans on TikTok first. And then that translates to Spotify monthly listeners. We, we notice this all the time. And uh, also uh, the fans, uh, like we, we also uh, have this brand associations. So how uh, certain, uh, the fans of certain artists, uh, they you know, prefer certain brands better than others. Um, so we see that our customers are using uh, these data uh, very, very, they find it really useful. So essentially um, yep. right now with your chart metric, you guys are a fan growth. Fan engagement, fan brand loyalty mm -hmm. are all three things that we can find. Um, and then in closing, is like one of the things that I've noticed and seen is that one of the challenges a lot of Asian artists have is something very basic, the artist bio, the artist profile, the artist press kit. And often, mm. whether it's promoters or agents or whoever, they just say simply, look, we want the one sheet. 
Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, a lot of Asian artists struggle with that very basic promotional tool. Um, you know, and I was wondering, because you just recently acquired a company, which I think is literally called One Sheet, what was the motivation? And what is what could it provide um, for artists just across and more importantly beyond Asia? Yeah, uh, the company, it's called One Sheet that Club. Uh, that's the domain name. The company, uh, we learned about the company because they were our customer. They, they were our API customer using our data as the backend system, uh, using their own data, combining that as well. Uh, we liked that concept quite a bit, quite a lot from the very beginning because we already knew that our users were asking for this type of tool. Okay, chart metric is great. I can go and log in and see all the data, but I, I frequently need to share this data with uh, marketing agencies and with, with uh, our promoters. So can I easily print out or easily create a, you know, one single uh, page uh, that I can share with others? So we liked that concept and thought about actually, all right, that's a fun, you know, that's not, they're using our data already. So we have the data already. It's probably not that difficult to create this on our own. So we thought about it. We, we tried and we drew some mock-up and tried uh, creating a basic uh, concept. But somehow I did not really uh, love uh, that uh, design, our own design or our own take. Because we didn't want to copy paste that, you know, their tool, and we wanted to have our own way of interpreting and then creating that one sheet tool. I didn't like it. So in the end, all right, how about we, yeah, go and acquire? So we engaged in that conversation. And luckily, luckily, uh, they were willing to sell, and all these things happened. Now one sheet is under chart metric. And a uh, shameless plug, it's out of beta. It's now widely available. It is, yes, out of beta, widely available. Okay. Available, yes. Right. Um, we have to wrap up here. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody has questions, they could probably find him wandering around. So please, but thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. And enjoy the rest of your thank music you. matters, all that matters. Thank you. Thank you.